Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, welcome to this session uh, about the philosophy and practice of academic makerspaces. My name is Moshe Kam. I'm Dean of Engineering at New Jersey Institute of Technology, NJIT. And with me are the panel participants, Vincent Wilczynski from um, Yale University and Dan Brateris from NJIT. A word about the impetus of this presentation. Uh, NJIT has a small maker space at the present time, which is serving mostly students in architecture and design and some civil engineering students. You can see 3D printers and, and, and laser cutters of, uh, cutters of sorts. And we are interested now in uh, increasing this activity significantly into a 20,000 square feet maker space. And it is actually being built in preparation for it. Uh, Dan Brateris and I has uh, uh, started a tour of makerspaces in the United States. Uh, this is a map of the, the latest map of what we could find. We did not go to all of them, but we have gone to uh, very many. And part of what we will tell you today is based on our experience in this extended tour. Uh, one of the makerspaces that we found most attractive, comprehensive, well-designed and useful to the students is at the Yale Center for Engineering Innovation and Design. And our first speaker today is Vincent Wilczynski, who is the Deputy Dean of the Yale School of Engineering and also the James S. Tyler Director of the Center for Engineering Innovation and Design at Yale University. Previously, he was the Dean of Engineering at the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and also had uh, fellowships and assignments at the MIT Charles Stark Draper Laboratory, the Harvard School of Public Health and with the American Council on Education. Uh, and here we'll start uh, our set of presentations on makerspaces. Thank you, Moshi. What we'd like to do today is really set the table first by looking at the broad concept of makerspaces and then drill down to academic makerspaces. As we do that, we'll take on where they originated from. Now, the topic is actually trending. Within the media, it is becoming popular that magazines are giving it cover status, and in fact, it's becoming quite popular. Even magazines such as Better Homes and Gardens are encouraging their readers that if you love it, make it. We know we've reached perhaps a peak when we have our own game show, America's Best Makers. And like all game shows, the winner gets a million dollar check, confetti and success. And perhaps the fact that this has migrated into politics is another mark of success and impact. For the last three years, former President Obama has welcomed makers, including I'm sure a number of uh, members of this audience, to the White House to celebrate creativity and making. One component that came out of that White House initiative was an association of universities, 40 of them, known as Make Schools, to share ideas and to learn from one another. Our profession, though, is really rooted in this concept. From its beginning, we saw the whole idea that making was the heart of engineering. The calculations, the design of megastructures, such as this wonderful facility that we're in, the roads and infrastructures, and that was celebrated for a period of perhaps 100 years. And then something happened, and so the switch from pure making building to something else such as calculating. And the emphasis of math and science within the engineering curriculum had taken its root, perhaps in the area of 1950 or so. But we've been reminded during our history as educators of the need to keep this uh, front and center. And so people like uh, Henry Petrowski and the ABET uh, criteria have pushed us all to put the aspects of design into the engineering education. And where we are now in 2017 is this concept of engineering as making. As opposed to the earlier black and white photos of a non-diverse audience, we have a rich opportunity to bring in all disciplines, to bring in students of all backgrounds 
into this aspect of creating. Within the higher education community, we don't just offer the ideas of a machine shop, but yet we build programming around these maker spaces on the concepts of learning, making, and sharing to go from informal ideas to the more formal ideas. So they're not just simply facilities, but they begin to form communities. If you will, in the two dimensions, the pendulum is swinging from one of calculating during the start of engineering education, excuse me, of building during the start of engineering education to swinging over to the calculating side with the launch of Sputnik. The ABET criteria have perhaps pushed that pendulum back towards the hands-on design, the hands-on building, and certainly the arrival now of the academic makerspaces has us in a unique area. When it comes to the types of makerspaces that are in existence, Marty Culpepper from MIT is one of the leads who has defined the types as being spaces for community, spaces for projects, and spaces for courses. In the broader uh, view of making itself, we can take a look at this, where did this concept of making actually come from? Some of the origins are tied to the advancements in the software industry and the hardware industry, and then their incorporation by a larger audience, as well as within the academic community. 1988, uh, Eagle was available for PCB design, a free uh, open source system for people to go ahead and use. In 1997, SolidWorks came on the scene where before 2D CAD was migrated over to 3, uh, 3D, with SolidWorks they entered into it originally from the concept of three-dimensional computer-aided design. And having that tool available, both in industry at the universities, it soon migrated down into the K through 12 disciplines. Picking up on the software was a development in electronics. Beginning with the uh, basic stamp and even beforehand, we now have microprocessors that are put on boards for people to access directly the pins and actually to code them, in this case, in using a basic language. Arduinos popped up uh, 2005, a little bit faster processor, uh, switching the code from basic to a C-based coding algorithm and making the connections more versatile and expanding the uh, possibilities. And in 2012, the arrival of Raspberry Pi. So not only do we have the microprocessor, but we have the entire computer available. This development in electronics had an analog development actually in the hardware side, where a faculty member, a neurologist, in 2000, developed a CNC router for the general public. You've seen the traditional machining of bridge ports and CNC mills and lathes that a manual machines were adapted. In 2007, Tormach had offered a CNC only. So there are no dials, there are no wheels to move uh, the part. It's all done CNC itself followed up by the proliferation of laser cutters and arriving on scene in 2009 is the 3D printers. So these tools, which previously had existed in industry at the hundreds of thousand dollars scale, are now uh, scaled down and can come into a small manufacturing shop at a more affordable price and make their way into academia for use by the students. During the same period of time, there's an ease of communication with the development of blogs and listservs so that people could rapidly share information. And 2005 was the creation of YouTube. So now training need not be done in a, a setting like this, but it could be recorded and shared globally. All of these advancements were captured by 
O'Reilly Media, led by Dale Doherty. And in 2005, they launched the magazine and then the associated enterprise known as MAKE. The key aspect when they started their work was that this was promoted as a DIY, do-it-yourself initiative. So with the software, with the electronics, with the manufacturing, with the communications, and now we're actually seeding a wider market with the idea that you can design, you can build, and you can fabricate. So associations were started around the world, and communities then were formed for people to come together, join, trade ideas, and create. Perhaps the first community, in fact, was an academic, the 2002 Fab Lab created at MIT, but this was soon modeled by individuals unassociated with the universities. 2007, Tech Shop opened up as a commercial venture where you could pay and join that uh, organization, just like a gym or a health club membership. New York City, 2008, uh, NYC Resistor. 80 members got together and started this community making in Manhattan in a building with uh, about 200, 300 square feet. Fast forward just a couple years and we have Artisan's Asylum in Cambridge. Uh, tens of thousands of square feet of facility and thousands of members that rent space and go ahead and design. And the last example is the um, Columbus Foundry. 65,000 square feet of making available for the community. Now, where does this then come into our worlds of academia? So we've added these in bits and pieces, as Moshi had uh, indicated on the drawing. It's estimated that there's 150 institutions with maker spaces that are in existence. If you track this concept using keywords from the ASEE uh, conference proceedings, in 2014, there was a single paper that included the word makerspace. That jumped up in 2015 to 22, 2016 to 49. I suspect this year it'll be over 100. A number of us, in fact, eight universities, have banded together to form a group known as the Higher Education Makerspace Initiative, where we share information, identify best practices, and get that best practices out to a larger community. To date, that group has offered a couple of uh, residential workshops on how to build, plan, and operate makerspaces. We also have uh, hosted an international symposium in the fall that drew in 400 university-affiliated makerspace um, advocates from around the world, and we'll follow that up at uh, Case Western in September with our second international symposium in makerspaces. And through this work is actually where I was introduced to the folks at uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Looking at some of the types of the makerspaces, we have this idea that they can be used to focus on courses, they can use to be working on uh, personal projects, and finally, the heart of the makerspace is really the community. So what distinguishes these spaces is really the amount of accessibility that they offer. They may be accessible to people in individual courses, specific departments, schools, or perhaps everyone at the university. The management and staffing could be just students themselves, professional management and staffing, uh, faculty involvement, or a hybrid. The scale is interesting because it could be 10, 100, or thousands, and similarly the size itself from 100 uh, square feet to 1,000 to a 10,000 square feet facility. But it's the culture that really defines the use of the spaces. These are not places to come to to simply do, but they're places to come in and learn. The community is a collaborative one where members help members, the staff helps uh, guide and operate, but it really is people learning from each other. Along the way, people need help, they need support, and they need understanding when things may not go exactly right. Some of the importance for success is to have a low barrier for entry so that anyone can walk in the door and feel productive and then build their, schools over their skills over time. 
Trusting in the students is fundamental to this culture. It does not exist on a series of rules, but really this understanding that the students are there as members and contributors. Part of that trust is that there's a full awareness of the policies and procedures, and then the attention that safety is part of that culture itself. A few examples that had been in existence, but just to show the variety of maker spaces that exist, and if we start at MIT at the Papalardo Lab, a rather large facility that supports one course per semester, up to maybe 200 students, and then one project-based activity during um, the summer. Very traditional machines, but also uh, not in this picture are some of the more advanced manufacturing technologies as well. While that's in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, the students themselves for years as part of the MIT Hobby Shop have had their own makerspace, a truly student initiative well beyond when this was actually popular, became popular through the rest of the country and the world. The MIT um, Electronics um, Recycling Society, where the students funded themselves by going around labs and picking up spare equipment that was about to be tossed out and went ahead and sold it. Totally student run, totally, um, at one point, really not even acknowledged by MIT itself. Stanford Product Realization Lab, the 1850 Department of Mechanical Engineering, Stanford Engineering Shop, which has now adopted it, the maker philosophy and has changed their operating uh, procedures. Across the road from that, 24,000 square feet, the D School, which focuses more on processes rather on product. Georgia Tech has been uh, one of the leads in a student-run makerspace by Craig Forrest, has been leading that charge. Uh, Department of Mechanical Engineering, Siegel Design Institute at Northwestern University. What we see is this large expanse where you have the working area next to the shops and then the meeting spaces that are surrounding the facility. So you're seeing this difference in scale, you're seeing this difference in size throughout all of these examples. At Rice University, the unique aspect is that this facility was built for the entire School of Engineering. So it services all of the departments from uh, financial tech to chemical engineering with the incorporation of a wet lab within the space as well. Arizona State University has an interesting affiliation with the tech shop. So this is the commercial venture that I had mentioned earlier, where the partnership is such is that the facility itself is owned by the company tech shop, but through affiliation, students have access to equipment that they perhaps wouldn't have as readily access to at the university. A rather large space and some of the unique equipment that they now have access to is a CNC um, long arm quilter, which may not be common in most of our spaces. And then finally, the Yale Center for Engineering Innovation and Design, where we took our engineering library and we moved the books out and brought the thinking in. Um, that started with a faculty initiative. Dean Kyle Vanderlick led a strategic plan, and this was one of the components in 2010 of that strategic plan. The unique attribute at Yale is that we're operated by the School of Engineering, but we're a resource for the entire university. Whether that's graduates, undergraduates, faculty, or research staff, and our membership, you get trained and you have 24-7 access to the facility, is such that 60% is undergrad and 40% is other elements of the university. An interesting aspect of the members themselves, so for upper class, 50% are from the STEM majors, but the other 25% uh, sections are from social sciences, arts, humanities, as well as the undeclared majors. So freshmen that are finding out what interests them and what do they go want to align themselves with. So as a small summary, we have the Parpal Auto Lab, which services 150 plus uh, individuals, including the training each year that they run them through. MITRE's being a student organization, the Stanford Product Development Lab, uh, serving multiple courses 
originally in mechanical engineering, but now spreading out throughout the entire university, and the D school that focuses on innovations and not innova innovators and not innovations. Um, when we look at Georgia Tech, another primarily student run, but this one now within the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Northwestern is unique in that it grants degrees, design degrees associated with the Siegel Design Institute. As we look at Rice, we see this serving the broad population within the School of Engineering and the public-private partnership at Arizona State, and then Yale being open to the entire university. A couple observations is that when building a makerspace, the reason that you're doing it is really key, and getting that reason right will determine all else, the space, the staffing, and the equipment. There is no single way to build a makerspace, so you need to reflect that space within your own institution. The community is the heart of the makerspaces. It is not the equipment, it is not the staff, it is everyone working together to establish that uh, culture. And it does take time to build that community, to build that culture. The whole sense in all of these images, you saw this openness, this use of glass to promote collaborations, to promote the exchange of ideas. If you build a facility and don't staff it, you're headed down the wrong way. So providing staff and giving access, having that staff on a schedule that meets the student schedule will serve the institution. And the training need not come all at once. So a segmented version of training where an initial amount of training gets you in the door, and then you add competencies for each uh, piece of equipment that is used. So with that, I will pause and allow a colleague to give you a little bit more information on the pedagogy. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about the role of makerspaces in academic education and put them in context of what we have been doing for uh, the longest of time. So I'm sure many in the audience are familiar with this traditional view of the education theory spectrum between, uh, between the view of learning uh, uh, via behaviorism, by cognitivism and constructivism. And uh, just to put it in context uh, and to do it in, in rather very general and perhaps somewhat crude way, the behaviorist view assumed that the learner is essentially passive. Uh, he or she is responding to stim stimuli from uh, the environment. Uh, it views the learner as a clean slate, a tabula rasa, and the behavior is shaped through negative and positive reinforcement. The cognitivist view tries to open the black box and, 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 and look inside, uh, understand the processes of, of the mind, thinking, memory, knowing, problem solving, uh, looks at knowledge as schemata or symbolic mental constructions and as learning as changes in these schemata and what is of focus to us is the constructivist view that the makerspace seems to fit in best looking at learning as active uh, process in context uh, you are uh, constructing knowledge rather than acquire it. Uh, knowledge is constructed based on personal experience and hypotheses of, of the environment. These hypotheses are continually reformulated and challenged by the, by the learner. Each person offers different uh, interpretations, somewhat vastly different even. Uh, and the learner is not a blank slate, but bring experiences, past experiences and culture into the process. Looking at the maker movement, uh, the maker movement in education aims to shift away from ready-made knowledge to an environment which, uh, which fosters exploration, creativity, innovation, and collaboration. And then at the heart of it is the understanding of learning uh, as, as it happens best when learners construct their understanding through a process of constructing things and share them with others. So we are all familiar with the DIY, do it yourself, but here we are talking about do it with others. And if you want to look back at the inspiration for that from, from, from the theory work uh, by Dewey, by Piaget, this uh, quote by Simon Papert, the role of the teacher is to create 
the conditions for invention rather than provide ready-made knowledge. And in the context of the makerspace, we look at as the learning outcome as innovation and creativity. But let me also uh, read you a warning of individuals who study that. We certainly uh, can fall into a different mode and educators who work with makerspaces need to intentionally pursue innovation and creativity or otherwise makerspace can become so-called imagination ghettos uh, as were uh, to some extent early computer labs and, and some uh, machine shops today where students are provided cookie cutter activities and, and rather trivial projects. So what's available and what, what makes it work? Um, so Vince mentioned quite, quite a few development. I think that one that need to be highlighted is the avail availability of design software that provide intuitive interfaces to perform design tasks that otherwise would have required a lot of expert knowledge. I mean, I know from my own field of control that nowadays you can perform pretty complex and advanced designs that you can do as a, as a student with, with basic understanding of the principle but not necessarily going all the way through and nevertheless get pretty successful uh, stab and stable designs. And then there is the availability of manufacturing tools and integrated control systems, starting with hand tools and power tools, and you can do a lot even just with those. 3D printers, laser, water, and plasma cutters, computer control, mills, lathes, and routers, and, and certainly suites for woodwork and metalwork and electronics for support. Professional guidance and supervision cannot be um, emphasized enough. It is a, a, a vital element in the success because you need someone with whom you will, from whom you will get guidance, especially if you are starting. Many of these spaces have physical or virtual libraries. I, I can also tell you that there are some institutions like mine where we started opening an area for students to meet and we found eventually that we need to move part of the library to this space. The students, in fact, forced us to create another branch of the library in another, in another building. And, and certainly makerspaces uh, exist in many libraries, but many libraries actually has, bec has become, to some extent, makerspaces in a sense. Uh, we are talking about meeting spaces. They are essential, near the workspace, quiet and accommodating. And sometimes it is forgotten, but we need to provide storage for these, uh, for these projects, sometimes for long periods. So in terms of the support, the makerspaces support the classroom and the lab. This is the more traditional part in experimentation, in enhancing instruction, mostly for simulations and creation of model. And in some cases, and we have seen that in, in, in several makerspaces that we visited, an activity of reenactment of classical experiments. We read about them and it would be nice to see them. So what we see in terms of enhancements of instruction, this is an example of molecular models, a lot of work with robotics, locomotion, self-location, navigation, sensor, sensor fusion, all of these are providing valuable learning experience that support what happens in class. Prototyping, urban modeling, uh, building models by, uh, by civil engineering and architecture students is very popular. Design of vehicles of all sorts, in this example, some drones, and I put their historical water wheels in an example of modeling of historical machines and inventions. We see makerspaces supporting the design experience, supporting self-growth and awareness. Several times it was mentioned uh, yesterday the importance to look at entrepreneurship as part of the experience that we provide. The makerspace certainly provided bot bottom-up, uh, provide teams an opportunity to work together, opportunities to lead, but also opportunities to, to follow, self-directed project, non-prescriptive project development. Uh, we are also interested in developing pr uh, of productive work habits, which helps our students later in industry or in internship and co-op jobs. And also we are interested in multi-term, multi-year designs rather than, rather than short-term in, in, in some cases. Industry found makerspaces in many institutions as useful in terms of providing students with a new set of skills, uh, among it experience with machinery and modern equipment. 
And also, there are opportunity, new, new opportunities to engage industry. We found that there are some elements of industry that are not responsive to our request to be involved in the traditional manners. But when this started coming online, all of a sudden they showed interest either in participating as user or in donating equipment or becoming part, part of the staff. So there, there, are, there is support here to multiple, multiple activities. The makerspace can be seen as an uh, amalgamation of the traditional machine shop, the CAD lab, parts of the library, part of, the, of what we used to do in the classroom, and certainly meeting spaces into one integrated facility. One uh, of the outcomes that we saw in many places is that students of different disciplines were simply thrown together into the same space and proximity bred collaboration. In, in many cases, many organized efforts to get groups together were much less successful than a facility, a, a facility of, this, uh, of this nature. Uh, it was mentioned that there is broad access. Some facilities are open 24-7. Some of them are open access to all students. There is, of course, train de training dependent access. And there are some schools and some maker spaces where it, there is a subscription model. You need, to become, you need to become a member. Doing a little bit of back compatibility, there is no question that the maker space can help an institution, can help a program to fulfill Many. This is not all A to K of ABED, but this is a, a, pretty, a pretty good subset. Uh, and in fact, what, when, you, when you look at this and when you look at criterion five uh, about engineering design, about the, the ability of devising a system component or process, you would think that schools that have this kind of facility will have easier time demonstrating that they fulfill that. And in time, it may some element of, of um, some element of uh, Maker space or, or even a mini maker space will become, I think, part of part of what we we do as a standard in order to fit these requirements. We are seeing maker space supporting the traditional design experience. Most schools have uh, design in the first year, so-called freshman design. There is design in the last year everywhere, but in addition to support of that, many schools, including ours is moving to design every year, every term, and that's an opportunity to do it there, to store it there, to, to develop the group around the makerspace. We have seen support of student groups of all kinds, competition support. Um, in our case, the, the Baha car, but, we, but many of you are participating either in uh, EPICS or EPICS-like project. This is the movement that started in Purdue engineering design in community services, uh, engineering project in community service. And whether or not you have this exactly or not, we have seen several schools that actually are doing uh, this kind of uh, learning service uh, in the makerspace, around the makerspace, and even involving the community to some extent in, uh, in, 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 the, design, in the design process. This is just a couple of examples from here and there of different car, different uh, in, in, the, in the middle, a, wel a, welding, a welding project. Some maker spaces serve adjacent high school and they found it as a useful recruiting tool. Some makers operate machinery on consignment for local industry. We found that uh, in, in several maker spaces. Uh, and in, in some cases, there is collaboration with small businesses and with, with incubators. Maker spaces serve to develop leadership skills. As was mentioned, uh, some, some makerspaces are essentially student operated and even when they are not student operated, students take leadership in many activities within the makerspace. Uh, as you know, in many institutions, in most institutions, research initiative and entrepreneurship were coming from the faculty and to some extent from graduate students and in many cases it come from above and was organized institutionally and we see now that students are doing it organically, especially uh, if there is a incubator nearby and there is a, there's a, a new tradition of students who work on a project and then incubate it into an incubator near the university upon, upon graduation. This is an example from Drexel University, a company that does uh, robotics for education that grew out of the Drexel version of, uh, of, uh, of a makerspace. We see um, 
teachers, instructors, professors administering a group of design projects under a common team, allowing students within this broad team to, uh, to launch their imagination. Uh, a lot of work on 3D printing for healthcare, uh, model inventions, taking exact bone structure of a patient for, uh, for preparation for implantation. Here are some examples. The, 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 the girl in, on top right was born without fingers in her right hand, and here is a, uh, a prosthetic hand that was made uh, in a local makerspace. We see a lot of work, including in uh, the school that hosts us here, Florida International University, that do design of musical instruments, a lot of work on wearable electronics, either for aesthetics or for, for, or for sensing. Uh, and this is a nice example. It actually comes from a museum in Hyderabad. We are a few universities and uh, in high school got together, built the makerspace within a museum. But unlike the makerspace in most, most museums that serves its own purposes, here the makerspace was used in order to build exhibits for the museum. Uh, and they actually have a whole wing now of, uh, of you see, a, a biometric um, experiment in the, in, the top, in, the, in the bottom right. You see a robotic experiments in the top right. Uh, a, 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 a very nice way to, uh, to, to serve the needs of both the museum and, and the schools. They actually went all the way to reenact uh, the famous J.C. Bose first millimeter wave communication experiment. Um, a few things that... Um, are important caveats, and, and Dan, when he uh, talks in a few minutes, will speak more about it. Safety is, when I think about what, what causes me sometimes uh, fear because of the existence of the makerspace and the new makerspace, one of them is safety, making sure that uh, the operation is safe, making sure that no student uh, or anybody else there is hurt, that the use is proper, that things are not done in the makerspace that, are, that should not be done, that nobody is, uh, is working on a plastic bomb down there. Uh, and uh, we, we also need to be very careful about the control of resources because of the fact that you are, you are as you go along, you, you, you spend a lot on materials and you need to understand how to, how to do the inventory and the control. So summary of opportunities. Makerspaces enhance the design experience of students and we are especially interested in self-directed design. They provide non-prescriptive design experience, which is a new face for engineering on campus. They are supporting entrepreneurship. They are providing platforms for innovation and for expressing originality. They provide meeting space for students of different persuasions, so to speak, therefore enhancing teamwork and multidisciplinary collaboration. They are, acqu they are acquainting students with state-of-the-art machinery. They are equating them with elements of manufacturing. They provide an opportunity for the university to uh, attract pre-university students to engineering programs, a new avenue to cooperate with industry. It was interesting to see how many, by the way, how many alumni and donors are now excited about helping us which, which, who did, did, were not particularly responsive to other campaigns, and excitement and fun. So the way that we, uh, uh, we designers, architects, engineers look at the new N NJIT megaspace is like this, you know, designs, architecture, um, the vision of the space and how to, how to uh, stuff it and, and populate it. And the way that I'd like our students and eventually ourselves to see it is like this. And with, and, uh, and with that, it is a place of, of ad adventure and excitement. And with that, to delve even deeper uh, into the mechanics of working the makerspace, I'll invite uh, Daniel Brateris. He's an electrical engineer. He's an engineering educator. He's cu currently serving as director of experiential learning for the Newark College of Engineering and program coordinator uh, of electrical and computer engineering technology uh, at, uh, at NJIT. And he's a graduate of Rowan University. Dan. Thank you very much, Moshi. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying our presentation. Um, I'm going to speak uh, a little bit about the logistics of implementing these facilities. Um, as you can see from our previous uh, presenters, they range from very, very small facilities to very, very elaborate facilities. And there are a lot of logistical issues uh, associated with building these facilities and keeping them safe and accessible. So I'm going to try to give you a 
quick yet comprehensive overview of the, of the things you might want to consider when you implement a facility like this. Um, so the first thing I want to say is from all the facilities we visited, there is no one way to do this. There are many common themes from one space to another, but every space is truly unique. Um, and the operation really has to fit your institution. So you can maybe fit it within the common themes of, of how to operate these spaces, but it has to work for you, your students, and your culture at your university. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, and I just want to point out that a lot of this uh, has been documented and is continually being updated in the Higher Education Makerspace Initiative. So if you are interested in this, you can uh, look at our presentation for a link, uh, and there's a lot of good documentation there in these good practices and procedures. Um, so the thing that we want to think about as we consider the design of a space like this is that it's a community. It's not a traditional machine shop. So we have to understand that we're trying to build a place that students feel comfortable, they feel excited, and they, and they want to spend time there. Uh, it, it's amazing how much these spaces can increase retention and can help students feel like they have a home somewhere on the university. So we want to encourage students to design and be part of a community of making and engineering. Um, to do that, we need the proper space. And the very first thing we need to consider is that the space must be safe, it must be adequate in size for our goals. It must have a, a good complement of staffing and training. And it has to have the resources needed to uh, fuel innovation, design, and collaboration. So when we look at these spaces, we typically divide the spaces into four different categories of physical space that exist within makerspaces. Uh, and they are a collaborative workspace or a studio environment, uh, a fabrication space, a design and meeting space, and typically some formal instruction space. And if you think about the overall design of these spaces, a good way to think about it is open and lots of glass. And if you look at all these spaces, the openness of them is what fuels collaboration. Students are working on one thing and other students become interested. Faculty are working in the space and students want to see what they're working on. And that kind of open environment can really fuel uh, multidisciplinary teams and interests. And, just keeping a space open and not in little compartmentalized rooms can really help drive students to the space and fuel innovation. Um, and a good example of that is this collaborative studio environment. Um, and this is, the big key point here is it's not a machine shop. It is a collaborative space. And there's two examples up here from Duke University and UC Berkeley. And you can see they are pleasant spaces to, to see visually. They are accommodating to work in. They have tools and storage around them, but they're very pleasant, and students want to spend time here, and that's very important. Um, here's two more examples, one from Yale and one from Northwestern. And you can see, um, and we've gone through these spaces multiple days, and these are actually very typical pictures from these spaces. It's rare to walk into these spaces during the semester and see them empty. Students are here socializing, building, testing, experimenting, coding, and we want these to be pleasant spaces to spend time in. Um, now the fabrication space is a little bit more industrial, and it can be. There's two very different examples. Um, in Tech Shop Austin, you have this very uh, well-lit, very um, busy environment where design is occurring. And then uh, in the Papalardo Lab at MIT, you have a very traditional uh, machine shop environment. But these are all located right next to each other in terms of collaboration space. So students can migrate in and out. Uh, they can build something and then go work with it uh, right next to each other. Um, a key element here is design and meeting space. Um, if you look at facilities that are being built around the country and, and lots of maker spaces, they include dedicated space for students to, uh, on their own terms, come to somewhere, sit down with their own group, uh, design, experiment, um, you know, write things on a whiteboard, just, just participate in a self-initiated design environment. Uh, here's another example from Duke. Um, and then, not all makerspaces have this, but uh, about half of the ones we visited have. Um, but they have formal instruction space right next to their machine shop, right next to their collaboration space. 
and that way you can have a formal lecture to talk about safety, to talk about a particular process or something you want to teach, and then you can either go right into this studio work environment or you know, bring things back and forth. It's very important to have those things uh, near each other. Um, so I'm going to give two examples. Uh, Yale's uh, CEID is probably one of the most well-balanced spaces that is out there. Um, they're not the most high-tech, um, but they have a very good blend of everything that is, that is needed. Uh, so if you look at the bottom, you'll see a studio environment, which is uh, lots of uh, tables. It's well-lit. It has 3D printers, hand tools, laser cutters, soldering irons, all kind of around that studio area. And, and students can have access to that space pretty much continuously. And then right next to that, you'll see a lecture environment. So if you need to lecture with a small group or you want to actually run a class in the space, they are physically right next to each other. Um, and then you'll look at the, the back of the ground floor and you have uh, kind of under lock and key the more industrial type things which are more dangerous and need a little bit more supervision, but they're still right in the same space. Um, and then if you look on the second floor, you'll see uh, quite a bit of meeting space. Um, very important uh, to have all these things kind of in one, one environment to truly fuel this kind of community innovation environment. Um, and this is our space, uh, which is currently under construction, um, about a 20,000 square foot facility. Um, and you can see that we, we have the same key things. We have our uh, staff offices right in the same spot. We've got storage and student workspace right next to each other. We've got tons, uh, about 3,000 square feet total of just workbench space for students to sit down and work. Uh, and then we have some very industrial equipment uh, nearby and tons of space for instruction and, and lecturing. So a very good blend of, of all those uh, needed characteristics. Um, staffing is probably what holds people back the most from building these spaces. Sometimes it's easy to find money to start the space, but to think about keeping it continuously staffed can be uh, challenging. So there are three models, uh, and m most spaces are not one of these three models. There's some hybrid of all this. Um, but we have, when we look at these spaces, we see employee-operated spaces, student-operated spaces, and faculty operated spaces. Um, and most are a blend of that. Most have students responsible for some portions of training and upkeep, and faculty responsible for other things, and full-time staff members responsible for others. So it's very typical to have a good blend of this to try to distribute the, the costs associated with keeping the facility open for long hours and not having to have you know, a full-time staff person there all the time, every day, 24 hours a day or something like that. Um, these are all pretty typical types of employees that you see in uh, academia, but the one that we might not be as familiar with is a design mentor, and um, many of the spaces that we have visited have uh, a full-time staff person like this, and in some cases they're staff, in some cases they're faculty. Um, they're usually uh, at least at the lecturer level. Um, but they have uh, administrative responsibilities in this space, but their largest role is to help facilitate students doing things. And that is to help, help them sort through design problems, help them figure out you know, what the next best step is. A lot of times they have a uh, good entrepreneurial experience. Um, and these type of people, if they're, if they're chosen right, can be very, very critical in, in helping to fuel students to feel comfortable moving forward and get the right um, guidance when they need it. Um, <clears throat> and this is a good example from Olin College. Uh, they do most of their training uh, in their space through students. So they, they take students who are highly invested in the space because they have a desire to build themselves and identify students who are, um, uh, have good skills in one particular area. And then they invest in those students by giving them some responsibilities. Sometimes they're paid, sometimes they're not. But they get a tremendous amount of new student training done by other students, and that really helps foster that environment of community uh, and, and feeling like they're, they're really part of the space. So um, the largest issue with these spaces is always safety. And as you go up the level of complexity or capability you have in equipment in the space, the safety becomes more and more of an issue. Um, so what we always need to focus on in these spaces is that we, we want to trust in the students, but we want to make sure that they get easy and 
um, early access to training. So uh, it's one thing if a student uh, does not demonstrate that they should have the responsibility, but we want to trust in our students first, give them the resources to uh, have access and get training, uh, and then build a community where students support each other by mutual training. Um, and the big thing to do is, is to create this culture of safety, which is where you, you're not in your face with safety, but you are constantly building a culture where everything is done in, in a safe and um, a proper way. Um, and it's typical to see this kind of three-step process where uh, any student can have access to the facility, but they must first go through a little orientation where safety is talked about. Uh, then they get some very specific training on some like entry-level equipment. Uh, and then they, are, they have access to the facility. And if they want to use more things, they can either attain student-run uh, training sessions or um, take online training for certain kinds of equipment. Uh, and in these orientations, typically you just discuss the facility, uh, who to talk to for help, where to go for advice, where to go to for training, um, and you review basic safety procedures uh, of your facility. Um, and along the lines of safety, uh, there are many things you can do which traditional machine shops don't do because there's so much rigorous training involved. And in these maker spaces, you'll see successful spaces have this kind of reinforcement of safety where uh, when you approach a machine or something, there's, there's a, a checklist of how to be safe with that machine. There's call outs on the machine of what to do, what not to do. There's links to videos. Some spaces have an iPad right next to each machine with a video of how to use the machine to refresh you if you haven't used it in a while. And if you follow these kind of proactive safety procedures, these spaces can be made very safe and, and very self-sustaining. Uh, and the most advanced way, which I'll talk briefly about because a couple spaces are doing it, are these kind of formal access control systems. Um, what we see when we go across the country is many of these spaces divide the equipment to these different uh, sort of like danger levels maybe, if you, you, if you will. Um, and each level requires a different uh, amount of supervision uh, and, and training of the people who are supervising. So basic hand tools can, in many places, can be used almost unsupervised, and you go up to large industrial tools and you basically need one-on-one -on -one dedicated supervision. Um, but the idea is that we're, we're not locking the whole facility down. We are letting students have access to lots of things freely, uh, and then as they, they demonstrate um, knowledge, they can move up that chain, and some of them become safety supervisors themselves. Um, it's typical to have these spaces open 24-7. Some are not, but many are. Uh, and, and typically, uh, access to dangerous things is reduced uh, in the uh, evening hours, overnight hours, etc. cetera. Um, and one of the ways that's done is by just placing dangerous things under lock and key. It's also done um, by turning power off to certain areas of the facility. And some, some of the more modern ways that are being done um, is on the, on the left, you have a, a key card access system. So when students get training on dangerous equipment, their, their card gets enabled, and they have to physically place it in the machine, and then, then that machine's power will turn on. Uh, and then the system on the right is the, that's the faceplate that we just sent to be manufactured for our access control system, um, which is a little more advanced. It actually has the ability to ask students some basic safety questions on dangerous equipment when they, when they turn it on. Hey, did you, did you remember to put safety goggles on? Did you remember to clear your workspace? Things like that. Um, and it has the ability to uh, enforce a buddy system. So more dangerous pieces of equipment, uh, two people have to tag into it to make sure there's another responsible individual around. So there's lots of ways to make these spaces safe. Um, what happens in a lot of facilities, and, and depending on the kind of students you have, uh, you can see organization kind of get out of control. And when you have an unorganized work environment, uh, it's where things get, people get hurt, people trip over things, tools fall on people, those kinds of things. So there are many ways to be proactive about keeping an organized uh, space. Um, one of the best ways is to make sure that everything in your facility has, has a place. Um, that means you, you consider tons of storage, you consider uh, every tool has a, a place where it goes. Uh, so this is kind of the most simplistic. If you have wood tools, you put them somewhere, every tool gets an outline and everything gets placed in, in one spot. And the kind of more advanced ways to do that are these kind of automated uh, tool check-in, check-out solutions. Um, some places do this with a, a tool room and they have an employee there. 
these systems are kind of like virtual tool rooms where it tracks what goes in and out. Um, I'd like to talk briefly about the equipment. Uh, we've divided it into four categories, kind of fundamental, intermediate, advanced, and state of the art. Um, and as we go through this, some of you who are familiar with it might, might think some of the state of the art stuff is not found in these maker spaces, but if you go to the right places, you will see it. Uh, every level uh, is, exists in some of these spaces. Um, this is the most fundamental level of stuff we see in maker spaces. Hand tools, 3D printers, laser cutters, small wood shop tools, um, test and measurement, and uh, a little bit of uh, metrology, hand metrology. Um, this is a very reasonable complement of equipment, and what's impressive is if you give your students this and you you give them access, that you will be very surprised what they will create and build with, with such simple tools. Uh, they, they, a lot can be done with a very modest investment into these kind of tools. Um, and you can go up from there where you have manual and heavy metal work, welding, and a bigger wood shop, and small electronics assembly, and things of that nature. Uh, the next level is kind of CNC equipments, water jets, uh, you know, very advanced 3D printers, and CNC metal work. And the kind of state of the art we see in these spaces now is, is five axis, metal work, um, real precision metrology, vision metrology, uh, and a few spaces even have metal 3D printing and, and wire EDM and things like that to help some of their competition teams. Um, I don't want to overstate the importance of storage. Uh, we even see this in our, in our courses where we're, we're trying to do senior design and it, it, we have a lot of commuters on our campus and it's tough for students to bring large senior design projects back and forth, so um, storage is paramount. Um, and the last thing, and we're really only including this because we, we didn't know it existed until um, we started looking into it, um, managing your consumables and your things that break and, and tools can be a, a full-time job on its own for, for these active spaces. Um, and some spaces consider consumables a cost of operation, some do not. Um, but there are actually some, and Gr Granger is a very good example, but there are tons of companies that do this. They will put some of these automated consumable uh, management systems in your space and they'll put it in for free. So, didn't know about that till recently, but they'll pay for the hardware as long as you stock it with their parts and they will send someone to replenish it for you and, and, and takes a, a large load off of managing a bigger space. Um, and uh, just for completeness, many spaces are only students, so only campus students or only students within a particular college can access it. Um, some of those spaces, their access is completely free. Um, and then some of those spaces, the students have to pay small amounts to use certain pieces of equipment or pay per gram on what they print uh, on a 3D printer. Some of that can help recoup uh, operating costs um, and then there are also some spaces that allow external uh, clients to come in. They, they sell uh, a membership per month or something like that. Um, and then these spaces also can get used in the summer to fuel innovation camps and introductions for high school and middle school students to engineering. And they can truly become a very good recruiting tool. And uh, we do see many spaces that actually charge small amounts to high schools and, and summer camps to come in and run uh, sessions in these spaces. So um, with that, I uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, we will take some questions. Okay, we have some yeah, time for a lot, questions. A lot in 19 minutes. <laughs> Please. Let, let, let the mic get there. Did you have any conversations about how to move machinists and staff and faculty that have run traditional machine shops into this more accessible model? Want to start that? Sure, I can respond to that at um, Yale. What we did is actually did a staffing model um, complementary to the traditional machinists. It, at the School of Engineering, we have our traditional machine shop as we all do, um, but for this space, we wanted a special type of staff. Someone that is, um, in our case, credentialed to teach class, so a PhD that could teach class, but also manage the shop itself. 
So we took a fresh approach of what that uh, staffing is, and the staffs actually work closely together. The traditional machinists in the uh, shop itself, and then our PhD level supervisor within the space. Um, Yale has a association of all the shop managers, and so it's easy for people to collaborate at that level of sharing best practices. So at, at, at NJIT, we actually moved some machinist line into the maker space. And as you can imagine, it is not the smoothest of uh, processes, but it worked. But we have also good uh, appreciation of the capabilities of the maker space for machinists in the other shops. So it, it, it helps because of the fact that there are capabilities that now everybody can use. Additional questions? Yes, uh, 3D printing it has moved from plastic-based to another metal-based machines, which are at the high end of the spectrum. So how do you use the students to make use of those machines? Okay, well, well that's a little a bit of a tricky question because it is so new. Um, so our, our space will actually have a metal 3D printer, and we are, um, our current plan for that is to use it as part of coursework. Um, and to basically, if someone wants to 3D print something in metal, they'll, they'll have to do a reasonable amount of prototyping before they get to that point. Um, we are having a program in additive manufacturing, uh, which will focus a little bit on that. Uh, so all the considerations associated with manufacturing things in additive metal. Um, but it's certainly not going to be a, a very accessible piece of equipment. It's going to be there, um, but we're going to have to work with design teams to, to determine if there's merit for them using that machine. So it's not going to be like a walk up to a three quarters of a million dollar um, additive metal machine and, and just hit print. Uh, it's going to be a lot more controlled, but we do want to have it as something that is accessible uh, in the right circumstances. Please. Uh, safety issues on off-hour usage. So can you talk a little bit about how that it's done? Are you hiring permanent staff to manage these facilities, you know, say after 6 o'clock, or are you utilizing students with certain prerequisite uh, safety training? L let me start. P part of the solution is that not all equipment is available at all times, and certainly some of the equipment that is more complicated, more dangerous, more prone to be broken, uh, and, and requires more precautions in terms of, sa of safety, is just not operating at these hours. Uh, so this is, this is one solution. And we, at, at the makerspace that we have right now, and at the one that we are building, we will have someone there all the time. It will never be open just with students, but I know that other places work differently. I, I want to say one more thing about that is that, so when we started um, trying to find ways to supervise these shops in, in the after hours, um, we started reaching out to graduate students in our departments, and we were truly surprised at some of the qualifications that our graduate students had. So we wanted to offer welding in the after hours and, be, and let students do that. Uh, and we had six graduate students who were master welders and had degrees from different places. So we were able to basically invest in hiring them as lower cost student workers, but give them some uh, you know, responsibility. Um, you know, we have to be very careful with, with equipment like that, but we carefully outline what, what is uh, acceptable and what hours it can be done. And they are entrusted with a key to turn that equipment on and off. And uh, so far it has worked out very well, um, but it has to be done responsibly. Uh, but I don't think you necessarily need a full-time uh, staff member for all levels of supervision all the time. Uh, you know, it can definitely be a balance. On the topic of safety, the uh, International Symposium on Academic Makerspaces, there were uh, 265 pages of proceedings that are available online, so International Symposium on Academic Makerspaces, you could find it. And specifically, there's a paper on control banding for safety. Just like in the biology, we have BSL 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 uh, control bands. You can do the same thing regarding safety, and then the training, certification, authorization, and oversight that's needed to use those, that equipment within that band can be handled collectively. And there's other papers on the topic of safety as well. 
on academic maker spaces. I'd like to hear more about strategies employed to secure external funding. <laughs> okay, so I, I, can, I can tell you that um, I'm sure that every school's story is unique, right? We are, a NJT is a state school, and we needed an investment of about, in our estimate, about four, four point two million dollars in order to get everything run and bought. And we did it in, as a combination of, for a couple of years, um, appealing to the legislature until eventually the legislature heard us and in addition, we have one successful year where we have exceeded our tuition projection. That happens one, I think, every millennium. But it did happen on time, so we, 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 we did it this way. However, so that is like big amounts, of, big amounts of money. We did get, so let me say something about equipment. You don't want to advise, the, uh, to advertise that you need equipment so that everybody dumps on you whatever, you know, they don't need. So rather than doing that, we explain what we are looking for. And we had a few very cool machines, especially, for example, Stryker gave us a very expensive, I think half a million dollar uh, metal 3D printer because of the fact that it was, on our, it was in our wedding registry that we, need, that we need one of those. And they happened to have consolidated two units and have a new one and gave it to us. So uh, going to industry and saying, not what do you have, but here is what we need and see if you can get something, also help. We also found, as I indicated earlier, talking about smaller amount of money, that there, are, there is some segment of the donor population that does not resonate with other appeals of the university, but this is something that directly responds to their, to their needs. Uh, I think that this is the time that we had. I appreciate your kind attention, and I hope to have the opportunity to discuss it with you. Please thank the speakers. Sorry.